Welcome to a new session of Technology Insights at Persistent. I am Dhruva Ray and I will talk about designing web architectures for exploratory visualization. Before we dive into technical details, I want to spend some time explaining the continuum of visualization categories so that we understand exactly what is meant by exploratory visualization, where it fits in the overall scheme of things, and how best we can build an architecture to empower effective exploratory visualization. At one end of the spectrum, our knowledge and understanding of data set characteristics are very low. So we use plots, such as scatter plots, histograms, to get a feel of data set features, such as what are the trends, what are the outliers, what are the correlation coefficients. At this point of time, we are not really interested in sharing our findings with any audience. This is really the realm of pure exploratory data visualization, and it is one of the many tools in the bigger space of exploratory data analysis. Notice that the plots in this phase are not very interactive as well. At the other end of the spectrum lies explanatory data visualization. Explanatory data visualization is more appropriate when you have understood what your data wants to say and you want to convey that story to a wider audience. Explanatory data visualization is really part of the presentation phase and therefore you are given some editorial freedom of what information stays in and what information goes out. So it's really a process of selecting a very focused da data set to support the story you want to tell to your audience. This is an example of an explanatory data visualization. The airline industry believes that it is far easier to predict flight delays during winters rather than summers because summer thunderstorms are unpredictable. So notice that there is no interactivity in these kind of visualizations because you are stating a conclusion from your data. In between these two extremes lies a very interesting space which is part exploratory and part explanatory. In this space, a curated data set is given and presented to the audience to allow exploration on their part. These visualizations are necessarily interactive and it is very much likely maybe even desirable that the audience can come up with certain observations and findings that the original creator of the visualization didn't anticipate. So these visualizations are characterized, are characterized and associated with a certain free freedom of discovery of information. Today's talk is going to focus on how we can build architectures for this very, very interesting space. Before we do that, let me give you an example of an exploratory, explanatory visualization which I will use as a guide throughout the talk. Let's take the example of the airline industry. Let's say we want to analyze the impact of distance, the impact of time, and the impact of date on flight delays. So we get the delay data from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. We get the distance data between two airports from the Great Circle Mapper database. We join these two data sets, we clean it, we curate it, and we come up with a data set which looks like this. This data set has four columns. The delay column indicates the delay in minutes. A negative delay means that the flight has arrived ahead of time. The distance is in miles between the origin and destination airport. So what kind of questions can we ask from this data set? Here are some sample questions. How does time of day correlate with arrival delays? Is there any arrival patterns for weekends or weekdays? Are there any arrival patterns for day or night? Are long haul flights arriving ahead of time compared to short haul flights? What happened on a particular day? And many other questions can be answered from this data set. So let's look at a possible visualization of this data set. This data set has four plots. The first plot shows the number of flights versus the time of day. 
We have 24 hours on the day and that is what is shown on the x axis. The second plot shows the number of flights versus the delay in arrival. The positive numbers indicate delay, the negative numbers indicate that the flight arrived ahead of time. The third plot shows the number of flights versus the distance they traveled. And the fourth plot shows the number of flights versus the day of the month. We can explore this data visually in many ways, but for the purposes of explanation, I will look at one possible exploration. So let's say that we select long haul flights. Notice that the moment I select long haul flights, the remaining widgets have got filtered to reflect the selection. Also notice the arrival delays. For long haul flights, most of the flights not only come on time, but some of them arrive even up to an hour earlier. Let's change the selection and select short haul flights. When we select short haul flights, notice that many of the flights are delayed and in some cases they are delayed by almost up to two hours. Pretty much like human behavior, right? Folks who come far away from office generally come for meetings on time. Humor aside, as we move deeper into the data era, here's a pretty sobering thought. This is a plot of machine power versus com human power. And you can see that as data sizes and computing capacities are increasing exponentially, our human cognitive capacity is essentially flat. So the kind of exploratory visualization I talked about and the techniques around that are going to play a very, very important role in the years to come. With that background, here's the agenda for the rest of the talk. We will evaluate traditional web architectures and see if they are a right fit for this particular problem space. We will suggest some changes and propose an alternative architecture for exploratory visualization. And then we'll conclude this talk with a couple of takeaways. So how does a traditional web architecture look like? A traditional web architecture has a data tier, a services tier, and a presentation tier. Let's try to build our example using this architecture. So when the user filters by the distance, what we need to do is eventually build a query which we can fire against the services layer. And that query will return the filtered data set which will be used to keep the rest of the widgets in sync. So these queries are not very big. They're typically in bytes to kilobytes. They will be sent over the network with a latency of seconds to milliseconds. On the server side, these queries will get translated into data queries which will be then executed against the database. If the database is big and your query complexity is high, the results will come back in seconds to milliseconds. Sometimes these architectures also have a cache component built in. So if they can be satisfied from the cache, you will get your response even earlier. So the response is then sent back to the browser and the browser uses this data set to re-render the widgets for the new selection. So we are looking at a latency of a couple of milliseconds to seconds and a data transfer of a couple of kilobytes to megabytes for each and every interaction the user is performing with the display. So is this the right architecture for our problem space? The best way to answer that question is to actually look at some of the constraints the problem space imposes on us. The first constraint is that we don't know what the queries are a priori and therefore the ability to analyze the data by building ad hoc queries is very high. And because it's an interactive visualization, you need to be able to give the response to all your queries in a real time fashion. So what does this imply from a systems perspective? From a systems perspective, it means that your database needs to be optimized for a diverse and complex query load. And the complexity of the query is coming because you generally return a very, very small data set for every query which is coming from the UI. On the services side of the equation, unless your data API is very generic, every new query requirement from the UI 
will force you to addi add additional APIs on the services layer. And from a UI perspective, it's a non-standard and a non-reproducible implementation for every visualization because you need to map your user interactions into queries which you will fire against your services layer. There's one other constraint which this problem imposes, which is we are working on very focused data sets. For example, this data set is not only curated, but it is also designed to answer only a set of related queries. In our example, we can ask questions only about flight delay. We cannot ask questions about uh, the revenue per passenger per mile and other ancillary questions. And therefore, it, the, and therefore the level of aggregations, the choices of aggregation, and the kind of derivative columns you may introduce into the data set are very important parameters in this problem space. So if these are all the constraints which the problem space imposes on us, then would it make sense to think of a client-side OLAP cube? Because we are dealing with very focused data sets, it's actually possible to load the entire data set into the client OLAP cube. Now, the cube is not only a proven, but it's actually an excellent data structure to allow ad hoc queries. And now, because the cube is in memory, you are guaranteed of almost instantaneous response time to any ad hoc queries which the analyst may be firing on the visualization. There are some other side benefits of this architecture. For example, because you are going to map every user, in, user interaction into an OLAP operation, you have a possibility of building a systemic solution to the problem. And when I say OLAP operation, I mean operations such as slice, dice, roll, pivot, and things like that. If you design it even better, you can actually bind your widget data to dimension, facts, and dimension and facts of the cube. So let's take a look at our problem once again. When we get this data set from the server onto the client, we can actually load it into a client-side cube, which looks like this. So the cube has three dimensions. It has a delay dimension, it has a time dimension, and it has a distance dimension. And the intersection of these dimensions is a count aggregate, which counts the number of flights for those selected values. When the user actually filters by distance, what is actually happening behind the scenes is that you're slicing this cube by the distance dimension. Your architecture now changes into something like this. You have an OLAP engine which is inside your browser and you load the OLAP engine with a data view. You need to build a translator on the top which will take the user interactions and translate them into OLAP queries. So how do you achieve that today? I will look at some of the libraries which are available and are open source. The first one is a library called CrossFilter. CrossFilter is used to power Square Analytics. Uh, it is very efficient. It can load up to 1 million records of data into your browser. It has support for operations such as top K, group by, etc. It's extremely compact. Uh, it has only 1,000 lines of code, which includes actually comments. It's written by Jason Davies, who also happens to be the co-author of D3. The second library is a library from the New York Times. They use this library to power the interactive graphics on their site. Uh, it uses a slightly different approach from CrossFilter, where you can arbitrarily compose queries such as a union, a filter, a sort, and intersect. The New York Times has also released a library called Tamper, which allows you to encode categorical data more efficiently. And because of that, you can transfer a larger data set from the server to the client. On the charting side of things, there's a library called dimensional charting, where the widgets natively understand the concept of dimensions and facts, and you can use it in conjunction with CrossFilter to build these kinds of solutions. So let's look at some of the positives of this architecture. Because you're loading the entire data set into memory, you're looking at a zero lag interaction. In the domain of exploratory data analysis, the views of the data we saw are actually called coordinated multiple views. And CrossFilter guarantees, guarantees you less than 30 milliseconds of delay when you're interacting with those visualizations. You can also pretty much work in an offline mode. 
because you are loading the data set up front. This approach allows you to also build very clean presentation logic. And I want to spend some time on that. The first advantage of this approach is that you can decouple your drawing logic from your data storage and query logic. And the more important thing is it lends itself to a systemic solution because you can map your user interactions into OLAP operations such as roll, slice, dice, and pivot. Most of these libraries also retain state. What this means is that if you're filtered by a particular dimension, and then the user filters by some other parameter, then the second filter works on the slice data cube. And you don't need to worry about retaining the state. Lastly, because you're loading a data view into the OLAP cube, your server-side APIs are very, very simple. On the flip side of things, what's the problem with the architecture? The first obvious one is that you're going to have a very high first-time load latency because you're loading the entire data view into memory. And at some point of time, you're going to be eventually restricted by the capacity of the OLAP engine. So in our example, we loaded around 2.5 million records of data, of flight data, and the size of that data was around 1.5 megabytes compressed. So a common question people have while hitting this architecture for the first time is, are we loading too much data? And I want you to again remember that we are in the space of exploratory visualization. So it's very important to think about your problem space and partition it appropriately so that you ask a bunch of related questions, you think about the level of aggregations, you build the right derivative measures and things like that. If you have done those things properly, then the second question to ask yourself is, are you guilty of overplotting? Are you respecting the constraints of your physical device? If your device can show only 1,000 points, are you sending more than 1,000 points to your display unit? Are your visualizations noisy? Maybe that's an indicator for you to build an aggregate and things like that. If you have answered both of these questions in a positive fashion, then the thing to do is to compress your data and you can use standard compression techniques such as gzip on your web server and you can combine it with the categorical encoding provided by tamper and at the last last alternative you can actually load data into your cross filter in an incremental fashion but the obvious limitations of this approach is that your data apis are going to get a bit more complicated and you're not going to get the benefit of a zero lag interaction so speaking of data api design I want to just touch upon that briefly. If you think about this architecture, the last mile query is really happening at the presentation layer. And therefore, your data API is largely decoupled from any kind of query requirements which your UI may have, and which is unpredictable because it's exploratory. So if you had to model our API for this kind of architecture, it would look very simple. It would look something like this, where we treat the data view itself as a resource, and if you treat it according to the REST principle, it becomes a cacheable entity on the web infrastructure. If you want to think about incremental load, you might want to give a slice of this view, and you might want to build an API which looks like this. Or if you want to get even more fancy, you can use custom OData, uh, you can leverage the OData specification to build APIs like this. So to conclude, I want to re-emphasize that we're actually building an architecture for this particular space. We have seen how a client-side OLAP engine satisfies the constraints imposed by this space, which is mainly the ability to fire ad hoc queries, a priori queries, and also to provide a zero lag interaction in the journey of exploration. On a cautionary note, I would also urge you to think about the problem space for which you are attempting to provide an exploratory visualization. Because it directly impacts the level of aggregations, the choice of aggregations, the kind of derivative data columns you may want to introduce, and ultimately, the kind of questions you want to get answered from your visualization. If this is done correctly, then you can leverage the architecture I just talked about to build compelling interactive exploratory visualizations. Otherwise, the danger of building a sophisticated data browser remains very, very high. With that, I would like to conclude my talk. 
थैंक यू फॉर लिसनि